anywhere you look, art has some other connection than just the fact that it's a piece of art or a performance. I would like to think that art has a position in society that is more powerful than religion or philosophy or education. And by that I mean that you have artists who have none of those credentials who actually look at the world with a very fresh, clear eyes and say things that actually help us more than those particular institutions do. So yes, uh, art is bigger than just the product itself. And if you take some of my pieces, the names are quite long. And those are my moments of trying to imply a title with poetry so that whoever is clever will take that title and begin to look at each word and expand on what's behind that word. And then that would be a clear interest into that piece of music. My history started pretty young. I started playing the trumpet at 12. I started composing at 12. And I read Marcus Aurelius' Meditation at 12. So you could connect those events as uh, having an occurring at the same moment in my life, which means that I started out with all that I have now, maybe. So philosophy is important, but my stance is more based around the idea of spirituality. That's why I mentioned that religion and philosophy and stuff like that have these competing ideas, whereas art can blend that into something else that has no consequences like it does in terms of religion. Art doesn't have to rely upon the responsibility of connecting with these other forms. But if you like to make your art more clear, then you begin to talk about it in terms of what it means to you. And for me, I like to look at it through the spiritual content, uh, dimension as opposed to the, those other kinds of ways. And therefore, what is important for me is um, the human connection. Uh, trying to make a, an art that connects with human beings that will knit their hearts together, their minds and spirit together in this immaterial context and have something unique happen. Like for example, uh, something like uh, harmony, you know, not musical harmony, real harmony. Culture is another thing that I look at in, in this context but I don't allow it to um, kind of invade my zone and become the dominant force. I look at it in terms of like, for example, when I think about the civil rights movement in America and the freedom movement around the world, okay? Well, in those cases, uh, often my works are talked about it being in a historical context, but it's not, it's a cultural one. And I can give you a good example. Um, my 10 Freedom Summer, which, which is a major work of mine, it's often the writers write and say that it's, it's about the history of the civil rights movement, but it's actually not. I took my, oh, uh, I took my name of 10 Freedom Summer from August Wilson. August Wilson is a, is a playwright, African-American playwright, who looked at the African-American experience in America in 10 decades, which is 100 years, okay? And he does it through culture. He expressed culture. I decided that I would look at the psychological effect of African-Americans being in America for all those, those hundreds of years. And therefore, there's a turn, there's a little bit of a twist. It looks at the psychic, of the individual and the American public and the idea of liberty and justice. What does that do when you mix them up and begin to ask that these things be uh, 
uh, rectified and put into some kind of really nice human context. So that's what Ten Freedom Summer is about. It's not about history, you see, because if I wanted to do history, I would have did it chronologically. I started off with uh, uh, Dred Scott in, in 1857, who, who sued the American government for his rights. He was, he was born a slave, okay? He lost, of course, but that case set a precedence of how you seek justice and liberty in this society. Um, you want to get that? Yes, I, wanna, I know I, I don't want to get it, I want to cut it off. So divine love, huh? Divine yes. love is a great record. I, I would buy it every time I saw it, if I had the opportunity. I was asked for at least five or six years to record for ECM, and I, I refused, you know? And I refused essentially because I had made my own recording company. And I wasn't that deeply interested in recording for other companies. But even before then, um, I had a connection with, my, with Manfred and Thomas, Thomas Dowson. Um, we, we both, all three of us, with Marion Brown and a drummer, we all played, played a short tour together. Whenever Thomas would come to America, he would give me a call. Sometimes he would stop by my house where I lived in Connecticut. Uh, Sometimes I would meet him at places, and he would always offer me the opportunity to record. And as I said, I would always say no. But at one point, um, this is like uh, 75, I think this is recording 77 or something. 78. 78. So somewhere between 76, 77, um, I said yes. And from there, it was pretty easy. We decided that I would do my trio, which was Bobby Norton, Dwight Andrews. And um, about a month before the recording, uh, I got a, either a message or a telephone call from Manfred saying that um, uh, uh, what's his name, Charlie Hayden uh, would be in town and if I was interested in using Charlie Hayden. And I said yes, because also I recorded a piece that's called Task Loom for Three Muted Trumpets. And um, I was using Kenny Wheeler and Lester Boy, you see. So I said, yes, I can use uh, uh, Charlie on this one piece, uh, Spirituality, the name of love. I mean, the spirituality, something about love, the, the piece was called. The language of love, that's what it was called. Okay. And um, we basically go in the studio and we start making record. And, um, uh, this is the results of it. And I might say that it's listed in the top 20 ECM classics. And that's no small achievement, you know. And then the other thing is, um, I named ECM. Did you know that? I named ECM edition of contemporary music. On that same tour that I'm telling you about, Manfred showed it to ECM. He'll tell you the same thing. I enjoy working with Manfred. He's a great producer. In fact, more qualified than all the other producers I've ever worked with. He's a musician. He studied music, played music. He has the most fantastic ear. I've recorded for all kinds of people over my 50-some years, and none of them have any idea about what a sound sounds like. Okay. None of them can come out into the studio and say, move the piano away from the window because they don't know what that means. He knows what it means. It means that the window, when the sound in the room hits the window, and if the piano is there, it bounces back on the piano. That's acoustical relationship. He understands that. Or he comes out and he says that, okay, move the trumpet over to the left a little bit more pull the cello up a little bit fo more forward, and then we record again, and then he comes out and says, let's do it this way. I have never met an engineer or a producer 
They can do that. Manfred doesn't mess with the aesthetics of the music, okay? Manfred mess with the sound. That's his forte. That's what he understands. He can say what the sound should sound like, but the aesthetics, he's not the one that wrote the music. He's not the one that's playing it. He doesn't affect that part of the music. I've heard the, the narratives that musicians say about Manfred, and frankly, uh, most of them are weak musicians. They are, you see. They blame Manfred for some of their own problems. I don't come in and just try to improvise and make a record. I have compositions and I have acrosmation scores that I'm gonna use and that's what I use. And nobody can inform me on those except me. Even if the producer says to the performer, well, maybe you wanna do another take. That's not an influence, that's a suggestion. The artist could say, no, I like that one. Okay, he could say, I've never had that problem. I've never been able to uh, uh, question what I should do this or do that, you know. No, on this one here, the one that uh, uh, Cosmic Stroke, um, on that one after each take, man, we would come out and do that. And sometimes he would come over and pat me on the shoulder and do that. Okay. There's no, there's no, he doesn't say do a take. Every one of those are one takes. They're not two takes or three takes or four takes. Only one take, you know. You're one of the very few to have your portrait on the cover on ECM. I think I was one of the first. Do you? Do I know why? Yeah, I do. You? No, I don't know why. I don't know why. I, I, I love the cover and I hate the back. Look at the back, take a look at it and tell me why. There's a play of power there. Let me say it this way. You see, when your liberty and freedom have been denied as a human being and you've lived on this planet with all these problems, okay, the moment something that's, that's, that's out of kilter or off kilter, you can see it right away. They have four or five uh, photographs of Charlie Hayden on there. Charlie Hayden appear on one, one piece. That's out of balance. That's completely out of balance. You know, I complained to ECM about it, up to Manfred about it. He said, we want to show these multiple expression of Charlie Hayden. Well, why? He didn't write none of the music. I invited him to play on it. He played on one piece. If they had four or five pictures of Bobby Norton, that would be okay. Bobby Norton is part of the music. You know, it's a great record. And like I say, I like the front. Uh, I forget the photographer, but he's a great photographer. The, uh, the Italian, the yes, yes, fantastic photographer. And um, I saw uh, he did a lot of these shots and a lot of my other friends were in shots like that. But this one here is just perfect with the, with the, the, the black coming out of the edge of the hair and the dipping down, it's just really perfect. I love that photo. When the rain falls, whoever is outside is touched by it. Some people will walk in the rain without an umbrella, and some people will walk with an umbrella and some people will walk with some kind of covering, okay? And each one of them have an experience of the rain, but only the one that walks without covering has the truest experience because the rain has become a part of them. It touches them, it washes them, it sticks with them until it dries or until they dry it from them. Whereas the umbrella you get a little bit of the spark of the rain, you see, just by the, by the function of the wind. But that's not rain, you see. That, that's, it's just the water from the rain. The rain drops, it drops, or it pours. And to experience that is quite different than from an umbrella or from a covering that only your nose may get a little bit of a moisture on it. So in terms of how to think about what my art means and, and how it's supposed to have an effect in the world. I don't really care. It's, it's the first answer. I don't really care what it 
kind of fact to that. Uh, my dream is, is that whoever experiences it, and they experience it live, that is in a performance, I don't have to make sure that they understood it or anything like that because understanding is overrated. Everybody says, well, I got to understand. It's overrated. You don't need to understand nothing. When you experience a work of art and you share that moment with it, it's already a part of you. It's already have become part of you, just like that rain. And that's going to affect you. You have the choice to block it, like with the umbrella of the cold, but no matter what, it's still part of you. And if you chose to let it influence your life, then it will. And an artist doesn't need to stand on the street and do something. I can reach more people by a composition than I can standing on the streets.